So um, if you were here at the very beginning of the service, you may have heard me mention something about this. Uh, but if not, let me catch everybody up. So this past Friday um, was my wedding anniversary. Somehow, uh, my wife has been so patient and kind and lived out this benediction and lived out the definition Paul gives for love. For 22 years, she's been willing to wake up next to me and stick with me through this life. You know, she did not know she was going to be marrying a pastor, and so uh, I always have a little extra grace for her, because when she married me, I was a youth pastor, and she had no idea what she was getting into uh, in a number of ways, that it was going to be me for life, uh, and that it was going to be a pastor's wife for life, and that's not always an easy thing to do, but she's lived it with grace, and, and the churches that I've served have been so kind to her, and let her be the preacher's wife that she is, and not the preacher's wife they grew up watching. But on Friday, we were experiencing our anniversary. We're celebrating it together. And our middle son was out of town on a school trip. And our oldest, as you know, is off at college. And so we had the seven-year-old still at home. Uh, My wife and I are headed out this summer. There's a couple in our church who's uh, sending us, or I guess bringing us would be the better word there, uh, to the Netherlands to do a wedding. And we are so excited about that. But you have to have a passport. And just like everything else in this world, it takes a little while to get anything done right now. And so she had this great plan. She said, Brent, I have it. Let's go on Friday downtown because the downtown courthouse is the only one that I can get a passport turned in time for us to make our trip. But while we're down there, why don't we bring Kingston and we'll do some museums and we'll hit the park and we'll have some meals. There's a gift certificate your parents gave us. We could have dinner at that place and then we'll be in Houston near Hobby Airport at 9 p.m. when the middle son gets home from a school trip. It'll be great. It'll be a great day. And it was. I mean, don't you want to spend your anniversary with a seven-year-old? <laughs> I mean, my seven-year-old above all those things. And so we did this. We went downtown. We, we dropped her off so she could do her passport. And he and I drove around downtown looking for things to do while we waited for her. So he'd hop out of the car, and I'd take a picture of him in front of Minute Maid Park, that big baseball out there. And, and then he'd get back in the car, and we'd drive somewhere else. We saw the Toyota Center, and we saw this big painted mural on a wall. So he hopped out of the car, so I got to take a picture of him in front of that. And then we saw this really cool spiral staircase that went really high into the air. He said he wanted to run up and down that. I said, hey, go for it, bro. So we pulled over. I opened the door. He jumps out. He goes running up the stairs and down. I'm a great parent. I had visual on him the whole time, but I wasn't going to stop and pay to park. So, So he's doing his thing. We're having a great time. And one of the stops that we made, finally, Corey was finished. and We got her, and then we went to this park. And I don't remember the name of the park. You probably know this park. It's downtown Houston. It's um, got, well, right now they had this big sort of memorial for a gun violence thing there. And there's like this Pixar-themed putt-putt thing there. And um, there's a big playground there. So we went there to hang out before it would start raining on us. And while we were there, I saw this most interesting thing happen. There was this guy, actually there were three guys and two dogs And these guys and their dogs, it was clear they were training them. And so I just kind of got caught up watching these men and their dogs. And there was this one particular guy who was a very, very tall man, and he had a Doberman with him. And he wasn't on a leash. I thought, that's cool. Dobermans are very peace and calming dogs. (laughs) And so this tall man walks by me with his Doberman. And for some reason, I felt no fear around them. And I just kept watching, and this is what would happen. The guy would say, sit, and the Doberman would sit, and he'd give him a little treat. And then he started doing this weird thing. I can't get my dog to do this, where he'd just take a step back, and the dog would like squish, like squish, like one more, what's the word for that? He'd like, scooch. Yeah, he would scooch. He wouldn't scrunch. He'd scooch. He'd scooch up, and he'd give him another one, and he'd step back and scooch again. And then he would like fake, and the dog would start, and he'd go, nope. And then he'd say, go over there, or something like that. And the dog would go over to a spot, not in my direction, and so I just kept watching, And the guy just walked away from his dog. Not very far, but some steps, and the dog just kept there, just laying there. And then he said, come. And the Doberman gets up, runs right to him, gives him a little treat. I thought, obedient. How many of us would love to have a dog that was that obedient, for one? A child, that obedient. A spouse, that obedient. A group of people you work with, that obedient. Right, this, this guy was just commanding the dog's attention, and the dog would do whatever the guy said to do. And it made me think a lot about us 
In this sermon series that we're in, I'm not calling me the master, you the dog by any stretch at all. It's probably more the other way around. But there's this, this way of becoming like Jesus that requires us to be a little bit like that dog. Requires that we become obedient. You know, if you were here last week, we've kicked off our sermon series called The Jesus-Shaped Life, Christoform, as we're calling it. It's just a fancy word for the form of Christ. Becoming like him. And if you were here at Ash Wednesday, you'll know that one of the prayer stations that you stopped at had a moment where you contemplated, considered, what would it look like to be obedient to Christ? What would it be like if you were obedient like Christ? And so today I want to talk about obedience. Now, I have been taught that there are a couple different ways that you can motivate someone to be obedient. Maybe you've heard this before. Maybe you've heard it with different words, but the words that I have been taught are the two words, the carrot or the stick. Have you heard this before? People are motivated by different things. Different people are wired in different ways to be, to be ready to be obedient when you offer one of these two things. And maybe for you, it's something else, but the way I have understood it is there's the carrot method. You get someone to do what you want them to do by saying, if you do this, I will give you this. You get a horse to go by giving them a carrot at the end of their task. If you just do what I ask you to do, I will reward you. I will award you. And so you're gentle and you're kind and you prod and you, you, you're not really forceful. You just put that little prize out there. And that's what motivates or inspires someone to do what you've asked them to do. Now, there's also the stick. And some of us are motivated by the stick. Do this or else I hit you with the stick. Do it so that you don't receive punishment. In the first one, it's there's a prize, there's a reward, there's a goal, and if you'll do what I say, I will give you this thing. And if you are motivated by the stick, you go and do it because you don't want to be hit. You don't want to be harmed. You don't want to suffer a consequence. I know a lot of us do this in our parenting. You discover pretty early in a child's life whether they're motivated or inspired by the carrot or by the stick. And all kids are not the same, and all of you are not the same. And if you think about how you've been motivated or how you've been inspired to be obedient to the people or to the systems that are there to ask things from you, maybe you've already identified whether you're more of a, tell me what I get for following the rules, versus tell me what I avoid if I follow the rules. You see where I'm going? This is the obedience thing. And as it comes to people of faith, we have longed to be obedient to God since the beginning. Well, not quite the beginning. There was the beginning when we were doing everything as God would want us to do. And then we wanted to be like God in the garden, and we ended up with sin in our world. And ever since then, the people of God have been trying to find their way back to this God. And all the while, God has been saying, here I am, I never left you, and he keeps coming. And there's this interesting journey happening with God and the people of God where they're both looking for each other, and from time to time, they find one another. Obedience is what the early followers of God thought would get God's attention. If we just do the right thing, if we follow all the rules, then we'll get to spend time in your presence. And even in those days, there were people who thought, if I do the right things, the prize will be eternal life. The prize will be salvation. And that's not something that we left back in our past. There's many of us in the room today who, who are obedient, or at least the best we can be, Obedient to God, obedient to God's way, his teachings, so that we can somehow earn the prize of heaven. It's the thing that motivates us. It's the thing that inspires us. It's the thing that keeps us from doing as much wrong as we would on our own choose to do. And it makes us want to do right so that we can get the prize of heaven. The people of God also went at it from this stick mentality. They, they had this sense that if we, we do the wrong thing, that God's going to smite us. God's going to wipe us out. God's going to kill us. And so we've got to do the right thing to avoid the wrath of God. And there was then and there is now still a little bit of confusion about what is it that pleases God? What is it that, that would want God, make God to want to be in our presence? And what is it that we have to do to allow ourselves into his? You might be surprised might be surprised by the answer to that question and to those strivings. You see, this obedience thing in the Old Testament, when the people were trying their hardest to just do what was right, 
do whatever it took to get God to draw near, to get God to bless them, to, to get God to make himself known. They did identify that obedience, being like God, would somehow get God's attention. And there was this prophet in the Old Testament, his name is Isaiah, and there was a moment when the people of God were seeking after God, and the prophet gave these words to those people, to the people of God. In Isaiah chapter 55, just a few of the verses, starting in verse 6, the prophet says this to the people. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon and then this quote from God, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. In this scripture is the very familiar line, God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And so to become obedient means to align our thoughts and to align our ways with the ways and the thoughts of God. Yet the prophet seems to say very, very clearly, that's not gonna happen it's gonna be really difficult for you to be completely aligned in this way. But then there's this good news. In verse 11, he says, so is my word that goes out from my mouth that will not return to me empty. Now, if you have been around the church and you've ever heard the first chapter of the Gospel of John, we teach this a lot of times around the Christmas time. In the beginning was the word. You see, Jesus is considered the word for we who follow him. That somehow when you read these things together, if Jesus is the word of God, then the word that goes out of the mouth of God will not return to be empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for what I sent. If you'll go with me just a little further down this road, if Jesus is the word of God, if Jesus is the word made flesh, then it would seem to me that when Jesus came to walk amongst us and to talk amongst us, the things that he did and the things that he said revealed the very heart of God. And if we would watch what Jesus did and follow him, listen to what Jesus said and do what he says, then maybe that, maybe that's where obedience lies. And so God sends Jesus. So that we're not confused about his ways and his words, he sends his word to reveal his ways. And he does it in the Gospels. And in Matthew chapter 5, we get Jesus' first sermon. Many of you know this sermon. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's a long sermon, packed with a lot of really good stuff. Throughout chapters 5, 6, and 7 of the Gospel of Matthew, we hear Jesus talking about many things. And you can flip through it and see it yourself. He talks about who will be blessed. There's this whole section, blessed are the, blessed are the, blessed are the. Remember some of these things? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they'll be filled, filled. And there's all these other blessed. You'll be blessed if. He lines that all out for us. He talks about how we have been created to be salt and light, to season this earth around us with the goodness of God so that people around us might taste and see that the Lord is good. He calls us light. He even calls us a city on a hill, that, that we're a light for the world. We have come, as Jesus has, into the world of darkness to bear light. He talks about this. He talks about relationships, a number of different things about relationships and forgiveness. And he tells us, don't worry. And then he tells us, don't judge. This is all in that first sermon. He, he talks about this ask, seek, and knock. He says, ask, seek, knock. These are the three ways that we find our way in the presence of of God. Jesus says these things. And then he, he ends his Sermon on the Mount with a story that maybe you've heard before. There was a song that I cannot remember how it goes. Maybe you'll remember after I read the little story here. 
Let me, let me give you this, this last little teaching that comes from the Sermon on the Mount. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine. So he's at the end of the Sermon on the Mount and he's, he's, when he's making this statement. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Remember that song? I forget exactly how it goes. Something like, the wise man built his house upon the rock. Anybody grow up back in those days? And the rain came tumbling down. Something like that, right? I don't remember the whole thing. but, But that's the story that that song comes from. So Jesus, the word, has come. He gives us all of these words, chapters 5, 6, and 7 in Matthew. And at the very end says, anyone who takes these words of mine, these words I've just shared with you, if you put them into practice, you're like someone building a house on a foundation, on a rock. But if you take these words of mine and you don't put them into practice, it's like building a house on sand. And when the storms come, the house goes. There's a a little sidebar here that's worth sharing. In my studies this week, I was reminded that just down the road from where Jesus is doing this teaching, you got Jerusalem where the temple's being rebuilt, literally. And some would say that that house was being built on sand because that new temple, the house of the Lord, was not being built on the rock. Remember what the rock was? The rock was, as Jesus said to Peter, when Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, Jesus said to him, upon that truth, I will build my church. The truth that I am the Messiah. And just down the road, while he's declaring all of these wonderful truths, there's a temple being built. The Jewish temple without the rock, without the foundation, without the bedrock. And as Jesus would say later in his life, that temple is going to fall. And of course, he's talking about himself, but the hearer said, the temple? It's going to fall? You're going to rebuild it in three days? I'm kind of hopping around here. But this this rock thing is pretty important, the rock of Jesus' truth. The truth that he is the Messiah. Now, this Sermon on the Mount doesn't happen only in Matthew. It also happens in Luke. And there's some interesting things that happen. There's a statement in Luke that doesn't show up in Matthew. Now, Matthew ends it with with this statement in verse 28 and 29. He says, it says here that when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. But then in Luke... This story of the wise builder and the foolish builder, it begins with this statement. And when I read this statement, it kind of caught me off guard. In Luke chapter 6, verse 46, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? The whole wise and foolish builder thing, he says in Matthew a little softer version. And and the softer version is, if you do what I say, you'll be like building a house on a foundation. And if you hear my words and don't do what I'm saying, it's going to be like a house on sand. But he like cuts to it. In case people weren't listening between the lines, he says it very clearly before he even gives this, this parable in Luke. He says, why do you call me Lord and you don't do what I say? I thought, man, he wasn't just talking to them. He wasn't just talking to them, those disciples and other followers, early followers. He's, he's saying that to you. He's saying that to me. Have you ever, I mean, do you want to hear Jesus saying these words to us? He's saying to you and he's saying to me, why do you call me Lord? Lord. And not do what I say. Why do you call on me as Lord? You say, you're Lord. You're on the throne. You know better. And then you don't do what I say. And then we wonder why our houses are crumbling. Like those built on sand. There's a couple reasons why I think we are this way. I think one is, in this room, there are those of us who have never declared Jesus to be Lord. And so if you're in the room, you're hearing the the preacher say, how can you call me Lord? 
How can you say, Jesus, become Lord and Savior of my life? Maybe some of us have said, I want you to be Savior of my life because I know I can't do it by myself. I know I want to go to heaven. I want the carrot of this faith. But the other part of that was the Lord. Jesus, I make you Lord of my life too. And I think there's some of us in the room who love that Savior part but don't so much love that Lord part. We feel like it's a lot easier if we just do things all by ourselves. We do it the way we want to do it. There's no way God knows everything. There's no way that God's ways are better than my ways. There's no way that God's thoughts are greater than my thoughts. I mean, I am the center of my own universe, and I've done a pretty good job managing things, at least up to this point. And you will until you get to that point where the proverbial stuff hits the fan, where everything around you falls apart, where all the things that you are managing and controlling come crumbling around you when the diagnosis comes, when the news comes. And then you're gonna fall back into the, I need a Lord. I need someone else to call the shots. I need someone else that I can put my trust in, my faith, my confidence in. And we'll start calling on him again. And the good news is he's still right there. In fact, most of the time, he's just waiting. He's just waiting there on the throne for us to acknowledge him, that he is on the throne. I know for me, maybe it's the same for you, those moments in my life when I decide to become Lord of my own life. It's not because I think I can do it better than God can, at least not like in my mind, intentionally, oh, I'm better than God. I don't think any of us go there. But I think sometimes for me, it's my pride. It's my pride that I'm good enough to handle this all by myself. I got a room full of people twice a morning on Sundays who think I'm good enough, smart enough, know God enough. I can do God's stuff. And then sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's fear to put your life in the hands of another to trust someone else that maybe their ways really are better than my ways and their thoughts really are higher than mine. It takes a lot to get over the pride and the fear until you're reminded that perfect love casts out all fear. And the God who loves us, as First John would say, is perfect love. You can trust him. I think another reason sometimes we find ourselves in this boat of calling him Lord, Lord, and not doing what he says is because our words are just our words. We walk around saying that we believe. We walk around proclaiming that we trust him. But maybe those are just words. I heard it once said that your your actions are so loud I can't hear a thing that you're saying. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's true, we've gathered all this information about Jesus, we've read through as much of the Bible as we possibly can, we've not retained a bit of it. J.D. Wald does this daily devotional that I've been reading, and and, uh, in it recently, he was talking about how we read for consumption of the scriptures, we read to see how much we can read, and, and I'm guilty of it too. The more I read, the more I'll know, but it's not always the case. Sometimes the more I read, the less I know, and the even less I do. And he has suggested another method of reading a little less and letting it take a deeper root. Reading it not for consumption, reading it not to say, I checked the box, I read my six chapters I'm supposed to read in my Bible for the 90 days or for the year. But I'm gonna read this over and over and over until I can put it into practice. I'm gonna read this over and over and over until I can be obedient to what it's telling me to do. Maybe that's the adjustment that we can make. We're reminded by Jesus' brother, even in the book of James, that we should not just hear the word of God. He says it this way, don't be just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Remember the old preacher joke? I think I told it several weeks ago that that young pastor showed up to his new church and he preached a sermon and then the next week he preached the same sermon and then the next week he preached the same sermon until finally the elders gathered and said, pastor, do you have another sermon in you? That's a really good one, but we've heard it now for three or four weeks in a row, to which the sharp-witted pastor says, well, I just thought I'd preach this one until I see you doing it, and then I'd move on to the next one. It's kind of like Jesus saying this to us. 
He said, you call me Lord, Lord, and I, I love, I'm flattered that you call me Lord, but I'd be happier if you do what I said. And the people around you would be much more enticed by Christianity if you did what it said instead of telling them what it says. And the wagging finger doesn't help a lot when you're talking to someone who doesn't agree with you and you start using the Bible to tell them why they're wrong for doing what they're doing and saying what they're saying and believing the way they believe. It's really hard to get anyone to follow Jesus when you're coming at them like this. <laughs> the unbelieving, non-believing, used to believing world is waiting for someone to hear these words of Jesus and to put them into practice. To become obedient to these words of Jesus, even obedient to death in selfless serving. This is obedience. We're gonna talk a lot more about that next week when we talk about the relationships that Jesus had and how he entered into relationship, but I need to push to the end. Let me just end with some really good news. Obedience to Jesus, as much as we wish it were just trying harder, like it's all on us and we gotta find our way to him and, and he's just standing there tapping his foot on the, on the floor waiting for us to get here. The Bible teaches otherwise. There's good news let me share this good news with you. In Titus, there's these words that Paul gives to his friend Titus, another servant. He's a companion in passing on the faith. He says this in Titus chapter two. He says, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Grace has appeared that has offered salvation to all people. It teaches us this grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Grace does this. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Grace does this. Verse 13, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us, from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. In this short little bit, we find out that the grace of God has appeared. It is what offers salvation to us. Grace offers salvation. It teaches us to say no. It helps us to say yes to the right things. He's redeeming us and purifying us, sanctifying us, his people, so that there will come a day when we are eager eager to do good. Good news, friends. God is not waiting for us to get it all right, to learn all the lessons, and to get in step. Jesus, by his grace, is redeeming us. He's purifying us. He's restoring us. He's taking us as marred clay, and he's shaping us more into the image of his son day after day after day. And as he does it, we're becoming people who are becoming more and more eager to do good, to be obedient. Stay in his hands and let him work. Let's pray together. God, in this world that we live in, obedience seems to be so much in our hands and there's all sorts of things in the world that, that are calling for our obedience. Be more like me, do more like him, look more like her, act more like them. And we find ourselves, God, sometimes in this behavior management, just circle, going round and round and round. And guys, we walk in circles trying to manage our own behavior and try to, try to protect ourselves from sin all the while, we are like clay on a potter's wheel. All the while, you are shaping us and forming us and molding us. You're taking off the parts of us that are of no good, and you're adding a little water, and you're putting it right back into the mix so that you can form us into something useful, something that, that would make you smile even bigger. God, maybe obedience is not always about the carrot of heaven or the the stick of hell, of punishment. Maybe obedience is simply spending time in your hands. Maybe obedience begins with saying, you are Lord. You are Lord. I want to do what you're saying, Jesus. I want to be faithful. But I'm going to need you to form me into that. 
I'm going to need you to be patient with me, gentle with me. And I pray that we, that I, I wouldn't get so caught up in trying to follow the rules. We get so caught up in trying to make you smile at me or keep you from frowning at me and instead would just sit in your presence and know that just like with Jesus, you are already pleased. You're already pleased with me. And God, I pray that your pleasure for me and the knowledge that you're working, that you're working, you're forming, you're fixing me up. And I pray that that would be grace in my life. I thank you for never giving up. Thank you for never giving up on me. I offer you my life again in Jesus' name. Amen.